Hola y aloha, everyone. Welcome back to our show. We're the voice for the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, Hawaii. I'm your host, Barbara DeLuca, president and co-founder, along with my co-host, Marisol Ruiz, vice president and co-founder. And we have an exciting show for you guys today. We're going to be talking about the history of Cinco de Mayo and our event coming up on May 5th with our special guest, Laura Angel Guzman. She has a couple of titles. So she's a teacher and um, the head of the World Language Department at Island Pacific Academy, the founder of International Exchange Programs of Mexico for the um, Island Pacific Academy. And she's also an honorary consul consulate of the General de Mexico. She served from 2005 to 2011. And we can't leave out the fact that she's a great cook and entrepreneur and owner of La Cocina de Abuelita. And for those of you who don't know, that just means grandma. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to our show, Laura. Thank you. Hi, Bien everyone. Bien. Gracias. <laughs> We're so, really excited to have you. Yeah, let's get started. <laughs> I'm excited to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. Yes. Tell us about yourself and what brought you to Hawaii. Uh, well, I'm originally from Mexico City. Mm -hmm. and I came here... Uh, over 30 years ago, wow. uh, I came here with a tennis scholarship. So wow. I got recruited by Brigham Young University, uh, mm -hmm. Hawaii campus, to come and play tennis for the university. So uh, that's how I ended up here in Hawaii with an opportunity to uh, get my degree and also to, to play tennis for the team. And it was a wonderful experience. Uh, those were my best years at BYU, and I was able to meet, uh, you know, uh, wonderful people from all over around the world, and uh, I think that helped me to connect more with my roots and to try to uh, share more my, my culture and uh, to, like, uh, truly identify myself of, you know, where I was coming from. Do you still play tennis? <laughs> uh, no, not anymore. Uh, but, I, <laughs> but I started the um, tennis program here at my at my school at Island Pacific Academy. So I was coaching for several years, uh, both teams, uh, uh, boys and girls. And um, I had to stop because it was uh, too much that I had uh, to handle. So, uh, yes, not anymore. <laughs> wow, they're, they're so lucky to have you. You do a lot there. <laughs> That and, and then just an authentic, right, Spanish speaker from Mexico. Right. And that's really, I think that's really critical, and really important. I wanted to ask you, so when you came 30 years ago, I mean, I've been here 20 and Hawaii's changed a lot. Yes. Um, how did, what was your experience when you came 30 years ago as a, a Mexicana? Uh, what was the, did you have a culture shock? Uh, there weren't that many, you know, Mexicans at the time. Can you share a little bit about what your impression was when you first got here? Sure, that that's a great question. Uh, it was it was difficult at first. Uh, I'm gonna share this. I cried for the first month, wow. <laughs> not every day, but it was really hard because uh, I was homesick. Uh, first time living home, uh, coming to a different uh, place uh, where you don't know what you're gonna find, right? But uh, what I really like, it was, uh, you know, the harmony that uh, you can experience here in Hawaii, the um, acceptance of, uh, you know, different ethnical groups. And uh, there were not too many Mexicans. You're right. And whenever I would go out and I would hear someone speaking Spanish, I was like, OK, where is that person? I want to, you know, start talking to, to whoever that was. Uh, because you miss your, you miss home, right? You miss, uh, you miss your right. people. So uh, there were not too many Mexican restaurants either. There were very few. Um, of course, you know, less traffic and all that. Uh, mm -hmm. I was coming from a big city, uh, going to a uh, campus on the North Shore, uh, where it's very isolated. And then uh, it's also um, LDS. Uh, a school, uh, a Mormon school, that's how, you know, normally they uh, call them. Uh, so Sundays were like super quiet, nothing to do. So I had to adapt myself to a lot of that, uh, to, you know, to adjust 
for for the new home that I had. Uh, but it was a great experience. Uh, it was really nice, and uh, I had the opportunity to meet. Um, Bija was one of the first ones that I met. Uh, I was still in college, and I remember that I met uh, Jose Villa and his partner. Oh, I forgot his name, but uh, he he's a Mexican, and both of them were very active with the um, Hispanic community. And that's how I started hearing about, you know, about the Hispanics in Hawaii. And actually, Bija had uh, a small um, publication. Mm -hmm. uh, publication so um and that's how i also got my first job uh through through his publication I was oh my, really my first my first uh yes uh job uh, after i graduated uh, it was uh, thanks to to that publication and contact him and getting to know uh an owner from a uh, flower business a puerto rican guy uh, Joe Perez and his uh, wife at that time, Isabel. And yeah, that was my my second journey <laughs> here in Hawaii. Yeah. And for our listeners, Jose Villa and Mari Villa, they're our founding members, and that's who um, Laura is referring to. Um, so that's interesting. Yeah. Um, tell us about your exchange program. Uh, so the exchange program I started uh, 16 years ago. I had the uh, the idea of um, doing something outside the classroom because uh, I always had that uh, dream of uh, going international and uh, meeting people from uh, you know other parts of the world, and I wanted to provide that for my students. So of course, being Mexican, the first thought was I'm going to look for a school in Mexico, right? So I sent a few emails and I got some responses back and. This particular school, the owner replied, uh, it's a school in Querétaro, a private school. It's called Instituto Thomas Jefferson. And, um, you know, she was very interested in the program. And since the beginning, she said, yes, let's let's try and, you know, see what, what we can do with it. And first, we started with the pen pals program. So we used to have some uh, video conferences uh, with, uh, not Zoom, because at that time was... Uh, something else okay. uh, but uh, we we used to have uh, you know twice a year uh, a video conference with the students so they used to know who was their pen pal in person at distance but in person and uh, sent letters the old way you know via mail and that um, experience that the students had when they received their first letter from their pen pals was priceless uh, it was so much excitement in the classroom, uh, reading the letters from their pen pals from a kid in Mexico that they didn't know and they were starting to know and seeing that they had so many things in common and uh, talking about, you know, music and things that they do on the weekend and stuff like that. It was a, it was a great experience. So that's how I started the program. Then through the years, I was able to add more things uh, up to the point where Finally, we were able to launch the first uh, group of uh, students coming from Querétaro to visit us for two weeks. And ever since, uh, we have been having uh, students coming to visit us. And actually, this, um, like, three, two weeks ago, uh, I had a small group coming, uh, six students with the chaperone, and they just left. They had a great time. Uh, they love it. And uh, they stay with the host families. Uh, I also take students uh, uh, every other year to visit Querétaro, and it's the same program uh, that we follow. We stay with host families. So the students uh, learn about the culture, traditions. Uh, when we go, we go during the Day of the Dead celebration. So they have the opportunity to uh, learn about that tradition and also to experience what it is to have an altar uh, and go to beautiful places in Querétaro and also to visit the pyramids of uh, the sun and the moon in uh, Teotihuacan. So it's it's an amazing experience. Yeah. How many students um, participate in the exchange? Is it capped at a certain amount or does it, is it, how does that work? How many do you do participate? Uh, basically, it's based on uh, host families that we can have. So that's going to determine the number of students that could 
be part of the program for that particular year. So just to give you an example, last year I had 14 students coming to visit us and I took 14 students to Mexico as well. So it, it all depends on that. But uh, like in average, I think the number has been like around 12, 12 students, 10 to 12 students uh, that we we take and that come and visit us as well. And if how do you actually find your host families? Do you could that number grow if there there was more interest in in of host course. families? And then do they need to be in a geographical area? Like do they need to be near IPA or like let's say I wanted to participate as a host? I'm out in Hawaii Kai. Uh, the opposite side would that would that work or or is there geographical restrictions? Well, that's a great question, and I haven't explored that yet the way that you are presenting it, that could be. Uh, all these years, the nine years that I have been receiving students from Querétaro has been with the families that I have here at IPA. So my students' families, those are the host families. Mm. And when we go to Querétaro, is the same thing. It's the students that um, have hosted, uh, that have come here, that host us when we go or vice versa. So that's how we handle it. Uh, it's been very convenient because it's very safe and easy to handle, right? But I'm looking up uh, into, you know, looking for new opportunities and expanding the program. Uh, also trying to see if other schools might be interested. And as you're saying, you know, if I could have more families participating, that would be great because it is a very unique program in the way that it's not just, you know, going with a host family and that's all, right? It's going to the school, being part of the school, uh, giving presentations, cultural performances as well. So when the students come to visit us from Querétaro, they uh, perform either they have a dance or they sing. Uh, and when we go, it's the same thing. Uh, our students go and perform. They dance a hula. They uh, chant the Oli of the school. So we'll bring the Hawaiiana to Mexico. And that's what makes it very unique. Uh, and uh, the students uh, that have visited in the past, uh, sometimes they cook for the host family one night. So it makes it more special. So at the end of the uh, program, when it's time to say goodbye, everyone has bonded really well that it's really hard to say goodbye. <laughs> So there's a lot of crying at the airport and they get really attached. And not only that, the relationship or the friendship lasts for so many years. So I have families that are still in touch with the, with the kids that they hosted in the past. And some of them have been able to see each other again uh, or the families have traveled and meet, you know, uh, uh, somewhere or in Mexico. So it, it creates a very unique uh, um, experience in that regard. And yeah, that's wonderful. I was part of a, a an exchange program, um, but I was in college. I would have loved to do something like that in my, uh, in, in younger, my younger or high school. Right. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think it, it opens your mind, um, you know, to different possibilities that you didn't, I don't think a newer possible. So that's wonderful. But do you fundraise? Because it sounds expensive. <laughs> yeah. so does, uh, you know, do we fundraise for it? How do you prepare for, for this every year? And it's been going strong so long. Right. Uh, yes, I do have a fundraising program. Uh, we um, sell, I have a food sale uh, once a month. And uh, part of the funds that we collect go to the fundraising program. So I have been able to do it for two years now that I have been able to give a stipend to the host families just to help, right? Because, uh, you know, here in Hawaii, everything is so expensive. So uh, it makes it difficult. So I have been able to um, give a stipend to the families and that helps in a way, like when we go on field trips, you know, they could pay for that or they could even, you know, pay for sometimes uh, special uh, occasions that they go out with the uh, exchange student, they use that money for that. So uh, that's one thing that I do. And I also fundraise when we go to Mexico. Um, but the the price of the trip when we go, it's very um, accessible because having a host family, it makes a difference. 
because you are not really paying for um, room and board, right? That's being covered. So basically, it's the airfare and uh, the field trips that we have, and of course, money for souvenirs and you know anything else that uh, they want to spend money on. Uh, but th that's how I have uh, been doing it, and also. Um, I have uh, started uh, started two uh, festivals this year. One was uh, the first Hispanic uh, festival um, here at the school. Well, I had two in the past, but this one is like starting officially now uh, to be able to collect uh, more fundraising. Uh, so we invite uh, vendors to participate and they donate uh, money for, for the fundraising program. And uh, the second festival that I started uh, this second semester was uh, a World Languages Festival. So again, we invited some uh, vendors and they contributed to the fundraising program. So I'm trying to, you know, expand the fundraising program uh, so I can, as you're saying, you know, um, help the, the families interested in uh, to be part of the program. And also um, I'm looking into... Um, having a starting a program for sponsorship so that's something new that i'm i'm going to start working on uh this summer as well wow oh wow it's not too late for you to um, participate in in the exchange program Marisol. <laughs> i know i'm like i chaperone. think i'm like chaperone yeah, yeah. <laughs> um speaking of exchange programs we're going to transition to cinco de mayo um we do have a high school mariachi group coming out from Las Vegas, and they're going to be um, performing at Island Pacific Academy, and they'll also be performing at our festival on May 5th, and um, Laura Guzman's class, she's bringing some students to help out in our Kiki Zone, and they're going to, um, you know, do an educational booth on, on what is Cinco de Mayo, which we're going to touch on after this, and then they're also going to have an interactive um, booth that has games that originated, you know, in Mexico. So we have Loteria, Piñata making, um, Pin the Tail on a Donkey, and musical chairs. Yes, it's going to be exciting. Yes. Mm -hmm. Very fun. Um, right? I, I can't wait to hear about it. Um, you know, actually, these games, how did they originate from Mexico? What, tell me about that. Well, um, the Loteria, it was... Uh... I think more like a game that um, it was very traditional to play in uh, the ferias. Uh, here we would call it the carnavals, right? The mm -hmm. carnival. So it was at the ferias when you would take, uh, you know, your kids, your family, and then they would have these tables uh, where the kids will sit down and you will, you will participate in playing the loteria and then you would get a prize. So uh, it was you know, at fun, uh, fun entertainment for the families, something very safe and uh, family oriented. Uh, the other one, the pin, uh, the tail to the donkey, you know, same thing. Uh, that one is a game that uh, I have learned that other countries have something similar, uh, mm -hmm. all differently, but it's the same, uh, you know, um, concept. Okay of uh, placing something in, uh, you know, somewhere. Uh, so that's that's another, um, you know, fun game as well. Uh, piñatas actually originated in China. That's what I, I know. That's, mm. that's where the, this concept comes from. Uh, but uh, it took more um, strength in, in Mexico and then it started expanding. And the concept of the piñata was uh, to break the bad energy and to get rid of that. So that's why you have to break the, the piñata uh, to bring positive energy to your life. Uh, but it, it's a wonderful tradition. Uh, the kids uh, really enjoy it and love it. And musical chairs, it's also something else, you know, in, in other countries that they have it as well. But uh, it's very classical in Mexico. Uh, the kids uh, love it. Uh, we play it differently in the way that we arrange the chairs. Uh, there are different ways to do it, uh, but it's it's a fun you know it's a fun uh, game as well for the for the kids to have some entertainment and uh, to get to know more about the culture. That's exciting! I can't wait! I can't wait for Cinco de Mayo. Let's talk about the history. Um, what it is, what it isn't. You have 
So uh, the history uh, originated in, um, it's going to be 162 years now that we're going to be celebrating this coming Cinco de Mayo. Uh, it's a battle that it was uh, fought against uh, the French uh, army, uh, the troops. Uh, it was uh, the reason why this uh, battle started, it's because uh, the Mexican um, government at that time, which was under uh, Benito Juarez, the president mm -hmm. at that time, uh, got uh, really in depth with other countries. So these three countries that Mexico owe money were France, Spain, and uh, England. And they wanted to, um, if, they, if the money was not going to be paid back, then they wanted to go and, you know, just take over Mexico. So they had to negotiate that. And uh, he was able to put a stop on it uh, based on an agreement that he was going to start making payments. So he was not able to pay the whole amount because it was a big amount, a large amount, but he was able, he was going to be able to pay a small uh, payment. Uh, England and Spain agreed to that. They were okay with that, but okay. France did not. And that's why he took the initiative and said, I'm going to take over Mexico because you guys are not paying back. So that's how the battle started. So uh, it was under the um, um, lead of uh, Ignacio uh, Zaragoza, General Ignacio Zaragoza, who led the, um, the troops to fight uh, back against the, the French. And uh, it was uh, a battle fought in uh, Puebla, the state of Puebla. Uh, they started coming, uh, the French uh, troops from Veracruz, and then they arrived in Puebla. And uh, the numbers that they have been mentioning through history is that there were about 4,000 Mexican uh, members of the troops against 8,000 members of the French uh, troops and they were uh, able to defeat them at that time. So that, that's what we celebrate at that battle uh, on that day, Cinco de Mayo, and that's why it's so important. Uh, here in the United States, it has uh, been compared or interpreted as being the um, independence of Mexico. Some people think <laughs> that. That's yeah. And uh, a fun uh, you know, experience that I had when I first arrived here in Hawaii, it was uh, that I had a girl um, from the mainland come into my room, knocking at the door, and then she gave me a card and a hug, and she comes to me. It was Cinco de Mayo, and she comes to me, and she said, Happy Cinco de Mayo. I wish you the <laughs> And I was like, okay, thank you. <laughs> and, card, and it was like, you know, Happy Independence Day or something like that, and I was like, Okay, <laughs> so it was interesting to see, you know, how it was perceived here compared right. to, you know, uh, what it is in Mexico. In Mexico, we have uh, a big parade, mm -hmm. uh, of course, in Puebla and in Mexico City, and there's no school on that day. But okay. uh, it's nothing compared to, you know, what uh, it's done here in the United States. And uh, it's, it's different, right? And it has also become more commercialized. And it's yes. a great day for bars, you know, for that day <laughs> to have specials. And it's, it's a big day. Yeah. Yes. I read that um, Franklin Roosevelt, President Franklin Roosevelt introduced Cinco de Mayo to the United States as part of a good neighbor program in 1933. So that's why it's celebrated more here than in, in Mexico, uh, uh -huh. especially in Los Angeles and um, Chicago. Uh, yeah. So big yeah. celebrations with over 500,000 people. So. We, we're sharing the culture here in, in Hawaii and our experience being Latino in Hawaii. And we're gonna celebrate um, our indigenous roots and, and, and what we share with uh, some hula, um, Native American, um, Indian dancing and drumming, uh, you know, some mariachis. It's gonna be a, a great festival with, with different celebrations of, of our culture and our, our diversity here in Hawaii. And right. the food, it's gonna be amazing. We have over 20 food vendors, um, yeah. What, do you, what would you like to say about the event, Mari? <laughs> no, I'm really excited about it. It's going to be uh, on the act, which is the first time we actually get to celebrate it on, for us, the day of. We'll usually do it like a day before um, or after. So 
It'll be on Sunday, May 5th from 3 p.m. to 8 p.m. And yeah, like you said, there's going to be food, mariachis, um, DJ. Live DJ. So there's going to be a lot of dancing, yeah, educational booths. Um, I'm super excited and looking forward to it. It's going to be at Fisherman's Wharf. And we can't forget to thank the um, Hawaii Tourism Authority. So they're, they're funding this event. So thank you for um, your participation and, and sharing our, our culture. It's actually a, a cultural, um, uh, like an exchange program, right? So it, it's, it's a win-win for everybody. And, and I'm so glad that you're participating with this, um, Laura. Thank yes. you. No, thank you for, uh, for inviting us. It's, it's a great opportunity. And I'm glad that we're going to be able to support you guys and, and to be part of this uh, great celebration. And, you know, we host uh, different events. And in, in this, it's this one for Cinco de Mayo, you're participating with us more on, on an educational um, side. But uh, just before we end here really quickly, can you talk to us a little bit about La Cocina de Abuelita? Well, thank you. Yes. Uh, so that's a family business, as I said. Uh, it has that name uh, to honor my mom uh, because it's uh, her recipes and, uh, you know, all her traditional dishes uh, that, that we have. Uh, so we operate at the farmer's market. So we don't have a, a specific place. We don't have a restaurant. Uh, we're mobile. <laughs> And uh, that's how we, we run the business at Farmer's Market. So the one that we do is on Wednesdays at Capilina in uh, Eva Beach. Uh, and that one is from uh, 4.30 to 8. And then we do uh, some special events. We have been participating at events uh, with Campbell High School and, um, you know, some other events that uh, we have been invited sometimes. Uh, and uh, we're looking forward to, you know, expanding and, you know, creating some more um, uh, ways of uh, getting the, the food to be uh, known in, uh, in Hawaii. Uh, in the past, we used to have a um, food truck, not a food truck, but, um, well, kind of like a food truck. Uh, we were stationed at uh, Scofield. So we were there for five years. and. Uh, then, you know, the contract expire and then we look for other ways to continue. And that's how we have been, you know, doing it through um, uh, food market, uh, the farmer's market. Uh, yes. I've been doing it. But I we see. have tamales, we have enchiladas, oh, we have burritos, uh, tacos, uh, tortas. Sometimes. I'm so hungry. <laughs> I love tortas. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen you at the um, Kamakana Ali'i. <laughs> Yes, awesome. we used to be yeah. there, uh, but now we're just doing the one on Wednesdays because uh, we also do here the events every month at the school. Okay. Uh, uh, so it's like trying to manage with everyone's jobs uh, because it's my son's helping now to run the business because grandma is, you know, uh, getting, uh, you know, into that uh, stage where uh, it's more difficult for her to to run, right, the business. So it's the the uh, grandsons and, and myself, you know, continuing with the legacy. Thank you so much for being our guest today. And um, it, was, it was so interesting and educational. And I'm looking forward to meeting you at the event. Um, to everybody watching, please come out on Sunday, May 5th, Fisherman's Wharf. It's a free family-friendly event. We're going to have a, a cakey zone, 20 food vendors from different Parts of, um, you know, the different countries, but actually Venezuelan, um, Colombian, uh, arepas, uh, empanadas, tamales, you name it, tacos, of course. And um, we are going to have a beer garden and it's it's also um, margaritas. But it's it's going to be a great event. So three o'clock mm -hmm. to eight o'clock. Um, come visit us and uh, get to know the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. We look forward to meeting you guys. And thank you for joining us today. And we'll see you in two more weeks. Adios and aloha. Thank you. Adios. Gracias, Laura. Adios, gracias. Thank you yes. so much. We'll see you on Cinco de Mayo. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Ciao. Ciao. Oh, gracias.
Aloha. We want to announce that ThinkTech Hawaii is moving into a new phase and will not be producing regular talk shows after April 30th. We will retain our website and YouTube channel and will accept new content on an ad hoc basis. We are also developing a legacy archive program to provide continuing public access to our content. If you can help us cover the costs of the transition and the development of our legacy archive program, please make a donation on thinktechaway.com. Thanks so much. Aloha.